participant, I introduce myself. I am Maria Angela Pellegrini. I'm a project manager for the European Reference Network on Rare Hematological Disease called ERN Eurobonet. And it's my great pressure to welcome all of you on behalf of the ERN to this session of the Eurobonet Thursday webinars. Uh, before starting, so before introducing you the today's lecture, I would like to share with you some technical information and some how home rules. So the, um, as you are seeing, this session is recorded uh, because we implement all the video in our, our YouTube channel and the learning platform. So if you don't feel comfortable with this idea, please switch your camera off. And also be kindly informed that the microphone will be muted along all the presentation. And that if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, you can both write them in the chat and it will be we will address them at the end of the presentation. Or also uh, at the end of the presentation, you will have the possibility to unmute yourself take the floor and ask the question, give a feedback, and by the way, interact with the speakers. Um, coming back to the programs, as you may know, those educational activities have the objective of promoting the interest on very uh, innovating topics in, uh, in order to spread among health professionals the cutting edge advances in the field of rheumatological disease. So with this aim, today we are going to assist to a lecture on primary myelofibrosis, so diagnosis and treatment. Uh, this lecture is uh, provided by Professor Jean-Jacques Kiladjan, who is Professor of Clinical Pharmacology at the Université de Paris, uh, Consultant Hematology and Head of the Clinical Investigation Center of St. Louis Hospital in Paris. And he's also an active member of many societies, including the EHA, the American Society of Hematology, the European Leukemia Net, and the European School of Hematology. So please, Professor Kilajan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria Angela, for the kind introduction and for the invitation uh, to give a lecture today about myelofibrosis. Uh, as uh, you said, I'm mostly involved in the management of patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms in St. Louis Hospital and uh, at the head of clinical investigation center when we, where we do a lot of clinical studies for these patients and in this condition. So today I was asked to discuss about diagnosis and treatment of the disease. Just a few words about the clinical diagnosis of myelofibrosis that is often discovered uh, in the workup of a splenomegaly that can be, as you can see in these patients, sometimes very huge uh, and very symptomatic. And it's a rare disease where it can be as much huge as this type of things, but it can also be diagnosed uh, in uh, because of anemia in the workup of an anemia that is also frequent and uh, also sometimes because of symptoms. And these symptoms include the so-called constitutional symptoms, unexplained fever, night sweats, and weight loss that indeed you will see uh, are taken into account in the uh, stratification and risk stratification of these patients. But these patients often complain of many, many other symptoms like uh, bone pain, abdominal symptoms, pruritus, et cetera. And it's uh, the uh, interest of our colleague in the US, Dr. Ruben Mesa, who developed uh, different questionnaires that have evolved across the time and the so-called now MPN uh, symptom assessment form, TSS, uh, 
that is translated in many languages and can be used. And this uh, tool allows to capture 10 symptoms. And as you can see, the patients with myelofibrosis, have one in yellow here, are always those who have the highest symptom burden for each of these symptoms, except for pruritus that is more frequently seen in patients with polycythemia vera, as you know. So these patients are highly symptomatic and these symptoms don't, don't only include the constitutional symptoms, but many others. Of course, as you know, the diagnosis of myelofibrosis can be highly suspected just on the blood film. Uh, although the number of leukocytes and platelets can be highly variable, you have some patients with very high counts, especially, for example, patients who evolve to myelofibrosis post uh, essential thrombocytemia may have elevated platelets, but also sometimes you have about 20% of patients who may present with cytopenia and sometimes severe thrombocytopenia from the beginning from diagnosis. And you will suspect, uh, as you know, myelofibrosis with the presence of immature granulocytes, erythroblasts in the periphery, and these famous teardrop cells uh, that uh, sign this disease. You can see on this slide uh, the uh, diagnostic criteria, the latest diagnostic criteria that were developed in 2017, and that include several sets of criteria, my, my major and minor criteria. The first major criterion, obviously, is to show that there is a fibrosis in the bone marrow biopsy. And uh, for the diagnosis of primary marrow fibrosis, you need to, to have at least a grade two or grade three fibrosis according to the WHO scoring system. Remember that system starts with grade zero when there's nothing, grade one, slightly loose network of reticulin only, uh, and grade two and three that are required for a diagnosis of primary myelofibrosis. Of course, your patients should not have uh, criteria for the other uh, diseases that may sometimes mimic uh, primary myelofibrosis like MDS, for example. And the third major criterion is to show some mutation or clonality and among the mutational landscape of myelofibrosis, if we look at the three driver mutations that are jak 2 v 617 f calreticulin mutations or MPL, you can see, as you know, of course, that the majority of patients has a jak 2 v 617 f mutation found in about 60% of cases, 22% or around 20 to 25% calreticulin mutations, and around 5% MPL mutations. We still have a proportion of patients who don't have neither of these three driver mutations and are so-called triple negative patients. And it's around 10 to 15% of patients with myelofibrosis. Just briefly to remind you that the JAK2 mutation is an activating mutation that constitutively activates the JAK2 kinase and the JAK2 kinase is bound to the EPO receptor. And then when you have this JAK2 activating mutation, your uh, EPO receptor will signal even in the absence of EPO. JAK2, as you know, is also bound to the thrombopoietin receptor, MPL. So if you have a JAK2 mutation, you will also activate the uh, TPO pathway explaining the proliferation of megakaryocytes. But in addition to JAK2 mutation, the receptor MPL itself can be mutated, the most frequent being uh, the tryptophan in position 515. And these MPL mutations also induce an activation, the, similarly an activation of the JAK stat pathway. But this time the mutation is not on JAK2, but on the MPL thrombopoietin receptor. And the third uh, driver mutation that were discovered uh, later are mutation in the calreticulin gene. Here, as, as you can see on this slide, it's not a unique mutation. There have been more than 50 different mutations of calreticulin that have been described, but with two more frequent ones, uh, 
the so-called type one, which is a, a deletion of 52 base pairs. And the second most frequent or type two mutation is an insertion of five base pair. All of these mutations result in the same uh, net uh, result is that the mutant calreticulin also binds to the MPL receptor uh, during its processing in the endoplasmic reticulum and is expressed at the cell surface and the bound mutant calreticulin to MPL receptor also activates the receptor. So as you can understand, we have three different mutations, JAK2, B617F, MPL mutation, and calreticulin mutations that all result in the same activation of the JAK-STAT pathway and explain you why you have this uh, efficacy of JAK inhibitors across these three different mutations. And importantly, as you can see, calreticulin mutations only involve MPL receptor, and that's why we don't find them usually in patients with polycythemia vera, and we don't find also MPL mutations in PV because MPL, as you know, is involved in the megakaryocytic proliferation and differentiation. But beyond these three driver mutations, like for myelodysplastic syndromes, by exam for example, many other mutations in many other genes have been uh, discovered. And as you can see, the presence of several mutations in, in uh, the same patients is more frequent in primary myelofibrosis compared to polycythemia vera or essential thrombocytemia. And we have a proportion of patients who have more than five mutations, for example, in patients with PMF. And you can see, uh, for example, here, one of our patients uh, that we have studied with single cell sequencing, who had more than 12 different subclones, harboring all of them, first the JAK2 mutation, heterozygous, then homozygous, and then acquired additional mutations like A6L1, EZH2, TP53, uh, and different mutations, EZH2 here. So in this patient, the clonal architecture is highly complex, and you can imagine that it's difficult to target one mutation and to resolve all the problem for this particular patient, for example. And of course, we also have a set of minor criteria, anemia, leukocytosis, more than uh, 11,000, xenomegaly, increased LDH, and leukoerythroblastosis. And for the diagnosis of pre-MF, you need to, re to collect all three major criteria and uh, some of the minor criteria. Why so complicated? You may uh, say that once you have a splenomegaly, leukoerythroblastosis, and the JAK2 mutation, well, you have a diagnosis of PMF. But no, we have to be careful and collect all these criteria because fibrosis in the bone marrow doesn't mean necessarily primary fibrosis because it can be found in several other conditions like myelodysplastic syndromes, some lymphomas, metastasis of solid tumors, even some cases of autoimmune myelofibrosis are sometimes discovered that require completely different treatment. You also have infectious or toxic causes. So many other causes can cause fibrosis in the bone marrow. So we have to stick to the uh, uh, diagnostic criteria of the uh, WHO to be sure that we have an MPN-related myelofibrosis and not another kind of myelofibrosis. Now let's move back to the clinical uh, presentation of these patients. What are the main problems in these patients? You can see that the vast majority of patients, about 80% of them, complain of splenomegaly or have a splenomegaly at diagnosis. The second most frequent found in about one third of patients at diagnosis is anemia, below 10 grams of hemoglobin. And the third, constitutional symptoms. And as we saw before, many other symptoms also. So the goals of therapy in myelofibrosis are mainly based on these uh, clinical evidences. First, we want to reduce the splenomegaly to improve the anemia or the cytopenia in patients who have cytopenia to alleviate the symptom burden that sometimes can be very high and obviously 
to avoid premature death and improve survival of these patients. However, the management of these patients is quite sometimes challenging because first, we don't have any curative medicine. Uh, of course, allogeneic transplantation can cure these patients, but all of them are not eligible due to advanced age or poor condition. We have only a few drugs that are approved for the therapy of myelofibrosis. We will discuss them later. And usually, each of these, dr these drugs is only effective for some of the, these symptoms and not for all of them. For example, you have drugs that may reduce the splenomegaly, like hydroxyurea or ruxolitinib, but they will worsen the anemia or the thrombocytopenia of these patients. So we need to personalize the treatment strategy of these patients based on their main clinical need and also their survival risk. So for this stratification, since the score of Lille that was developed by Brigitte Duprier back in 1996, we have more refined now uh, prognostic scoring systems, the most uh, popular and the easiest being the International Prognostic Scoring System, IPSS for myelofibrosis, that includes five very simple uh, risk factors that can collect just by seeing the patients and his blood count an age above 65 years, the presence of these three constitutional symptoms, uh, anemia with an hemoglobin below 10 grams per deciliter, hyperleukocytosis above 25,000, and the presence of blast on uh, the peripheral blood, just yes or no, is one risk factor. And you can stratify your patients according to these five factors. In low risk patients who have none of them, with a median survival that is uh, more than 12 years, intermediate one if one factor, intermediate two if two factors, and high risk patients with more than three risk factors who have around two years of median survival. Since the IPSS that was developed already more than 10 years ago, uh, we have now more defined, refined systems. One of the uh, more uh, most used recently is the so-called MIPSS-17 that indeed include not only these five factors, but also some biological results like the grade of fibrosis, but mostly uh, the molecular results, including so-called high molecular risk mutations that are bad mutations worsening the prognosis of our patients and the mutations that have been identified by the group of Alessandro Vanucci first are A6L1, EZH2, SRSF2, IDH1, and IDH2. So the presence of one or more uh, of these mutations clearly worsen the prognosis of our patients and may be taken in consideration to define the treatment strategy. So now, how can we treat those patients? You can see here, for example, the uh, proposal from the ESMO, but uh, all the proposals are almost the same that are based first on the IPSS score. And if we look first at the group of patients at intermediate two or high risk, the first question, because we don't have curative medicine and because the median survival of these patients can be as low as less than one or two years, is are the patients eligible for allogeneic transplantation? And if yes, we have to propose transplantation. I can, you can see here the gross results of transplantation that even with reduced intensity uh, regimen are uh, also linked with some transplant-related mortality and an overall survival around 50%. I just show you here the results of uh, the most recent prospective trial that we conducted in France with Marie Robin, uh, that the called Jacalo study that tested the use of ruxolitinib before transplantation in newly diagnosed high-risk patients that were not previously treated and in whom we have a plan to organize a transplantation within six months. So it's a short-term treatment with ruxolitinib prior to a transplantation. 
So the results of this trial were published last year in bone marrow transplantation, and the disease-free survival at 12 months was 52%, 46% at 24 months, and the overall survival is in range with what I showed you, 68% at 12 months, 55% at 24 months. You can see here, I just show you this curve, showing the survival according to the type of donor, again, which was the main factor. You see that with uh, uh, sibling donors, the uh, overall survival, the blue curve is very nice, and it declines with unrelated donors, 10, 10 or 9, 10, uh, mismatch, uh, the green and red curve. And you can see that unrelated donors with 9, 10, uh, compatibility is associated with very, very poor survival and is not recommended at this time and only uh, uh, familial donor and 1010 with unrelated donor probably are suitable. Interestingly, you see here the curve, yellow curve represents the patients who were random, uh, entered included in the trial but didn't have a donor, uh, and they were treated with ruxolitinib without transplantation. And you can see that their overall survival is quite nice, similar to those with sibling donors for the beginning of the follow-up, but then after two years, it declines and goes down. So this may teach us or tell us that we can certainly treat patients that are eligible for transplantation with ruxolitinib uh, for a while, but if your patient is at high risk and has a, a familial donor, then transplantation should not be delayed too much because then you lose efficacy and you lose survival for these patients. Now, if we look at the uh, therapies that we can give to our patients, I have summarized on this slide the main uh, international guidelines for myelofibrosis, European Leukemia Net, the NCCN in the United States, the ESMO and the British guidelines. And you can see that for all of them, clearly ruxolitinib is indicated for the patients with symptomatic splenomegaly. And this is based on the results of the two so-called COMFORT study. COMFORT one that was done in the United States and randomized ruxolitinib versus placebo. And COMFORT two that was performed in Europe comparing ruxolitinib to best available therapy. And indeed, both studies showed the similar results that you know quite well, with a profound effect to reduce the splenomegaly uh, as first-line therapy and after crossover that was maintained after three or five years in both trials, and also to reduce the symptoms uh, of these patients. Importantly, and although this was not expected, Ruxolitinib also showed an efficacy to improve overall survival and was associated with about 30% reduction in the risk of death. You can see here the curves of uh, an analysis that pulled together for COMFORT1 and COMFORT2, the patients who were randomized to Ruxolitinib in green compared to the patients in the control group, either placebo or best available therapy, showing this survival advantage for uh, the patients receiving ruxolitinib. So if we go back to our four main aims of treatment in myelofibrosis, we know now that ruxolitinib as first-line therapy really uh, is powerful to assess three of them, splenomegaly symptoms and survival, but doesn't really improve anemia and even sometimes worsens the anemia, especially at the beginning of treatment. So we still have uh, unmet needs there. So how can we improve these first-line results, either by uh, having better responses for the splenomegaly or to avoid or improve also anemia in those patients? So one possibility is to combine something to ruxolitinib, and there are three phase three trials ongoing as a first-line therapy. The first one combines ruxolitinib to parsaclizib, which is a CI, CD3, CI3, PI3 sorry, kinase inhibitor. Uh, the second combines ruxolitinib to nabitoclax, which is an, a BCL2, BCLXL mimetic, that uh, a friend of uh, venetoclax, you may know well 
better probably. And the third one, pelabrazib, is a bad inhibitor. So all these trials try to improve the uh, deepness of the response on the skin size and the symptoms, but also sometimes to reduce anemia and induce some transfusion independency. So maybe these combinations will help us to improve the results of ruxolitinib alone as first-line therapy. In our hands, we have just completed a phase one, two study that tried the association of ruxolitinib and interferon alpha 2A in patients with myelofibrosis. Indeed, this was a phase one, two, and also a platform for the evaluation of some disease modifying attributes in these patients, because we hope that interferon can induce disease modification in these patients. And to show that, we have many ancillary studies in this trial. We, of course, followed the reduction of the MPN clones and not only the driver clones, but also the additional mutations by next generation sequencing. We follow the bone marrow biopsies with a baseline and 12 month bone marrow biopsy with some interesting preliminary results, as you can see, for example, for these particular patients. We also have a follow up of cytokines with a, a multiplex assay of cytokines. And we also follow the immune cells and the activation and evolution of immune cells during treatment because we know that ruxolitinib has some immunosuppressive property, and that the contrary, interferon alpha is an immunostimulant, and we will see if we can also improve the results by controlling, modulating the immunity of these patients. What about a second-line therapy? This is mainly due to ruxolitinib failure. Indeed, what is the response? We have some response criteria that were developed and published by the International Working Group and the European Leukemia Net experts. But you can see on these slides that they are very complicated. They were designed indeed for clinical trials. They include multiple parameters. Some of them are not uh, collected uh, routinely as for example, molecular response or sequential bone marrow biopsy. And it's almost impossible to apply these in clinical practice. But in addition, we don't have a clear definition of what is ruxolitinib failure. Of course, we can uh, try to see, for example, this one that was published by John Mascarenas and colleagues, that is quite simple. Indeed, primary resistance to ruxolitinib in my experience is very rare because almost all patients have some response in uh, splenomegaly and symptoms, but the problem is mostly secondary re resistance because, for example, in the COMFORT-1 and COMFORT-2 studies, we saw that after five years of follow-up, only less than half of patients were still treated with ruxolitinib. And this is due to loss of response or reappearance uh, of splenomegaly or symptoms. It is important to know, and if you have used uh, ruxolitinib in MF, you know that very well, that there's a clear relationship between the effect and the dose of the drug. And as you increase the dose, you will reduce the spin size and the symptom burden. And if you decrease the dose, it will immediately go back uh, to and re-increase in spin size and symptom burden. But in parallel, when you increase the dose of ruxolitinib, you increase and the occurrence of cytopenia. So we have to find this right balance between symptom and spin response without inducing too many uh, cytopenia in these patients. And if we look to cytopenia, we also have to keep in mind that it depends when your cytopenia occurs. Because as I mentioned, when you start ruxolitinib, you will expect for all patients to have a decline, at least for the first three to six months in the hemoglobin level and also the platelet count. But if your cytopenia occur late, it may be due to disease progression. And in the uh, diagnosis of these cytopenias, of course, we may suspect ruxolitinib toxicity, but if they occur after 12, 18, 30, 24 months, then maybe we should reassess the disease and not hesitate to perform a new bone marrow evaluation to see if it's not due 
to worsening of myofibrosis or uh, accelerated phase of the disease. Altogether, anyway, once your patients do not respond anymore to rixolitinib, what can we do? Well, we can switch to another JAK inhibitor because we have some other drugs that are available in this class. The first one is fedratinib, which is also a JAK2 inhibitor that was tested many years ago in the Jakarta and Jakarta 2, uh, 2 phase 3 trials. You remember that there was a suspicion of severe neurologic adverse events with this drug, including Wernicke encephalopathy, and the development of the drug was stopped for several years. Once uh, this uh, toxicity was better understood and uh, excluded in many of these patients, the development restarted with several studies, including this one, Freedom2, that uh, showed that indeed the drug was safe when you uh, use a supplementation in thiamine for those patients in vitamin uh, B1. And uh, now this led to the approval in the US and the EMA last year in February of fedratinib for the treatment of splenomegaly and symptoms in patients with myelofibrosis who are either as first line, Jack inhibitor naive, or and second line therapy after ruxolitinib. So uh, the drug is not yet available in clinical practice in France due to the reimbursement issue, but we hope that it will be available by the end of the year for us and probably in other European countries also during uh, the uh, coming months. The second JAK inhibitor is pacritinib. It's a JAK2 IWAQUAN inhibitor. This one also was tested many years ago in phase three trial, the so-called PERSIST studies. And the interest uh, of this drug is that it was shown to induce spin volume reduction without significant change in hemoglobin and mostly in platelet counts. So therefore this drug was developed for patients with severe thrombocytopenia. And the latest study is still ongoing is the Pacifica study that randomized this drug against best available therapy for patients specifically selected as an entry criteria to have less than 50,000 platelets. And due to the data we already have, the FDA just approved last month's uh, pacritinib for patients with uh, intermediate or high-risk myelofibrosis and a platelet count below 50,000 uh, platelets. This is an important unmet need because for these patients, Rixolitinib is difficult to use, contraindicated theoretically, or can be used only at very low doses that sometimes is not sufficient to achieve a response. So we will have probably with pacritinib a solution for these patients with severe thrombocytopenia. And the last JAK inhibitor in uh, current development is momelotinib which is a JAK2 and ACVR1 or ALP2 inhibitor that has the particularity to improve the anemia in some patients by improving the hepcidin pathway. And therefore, the last study, the ongoing momentum study now, tests momelotinib versus danazole specifically only in patients with anemia less than 10 gram per deciliter so this will be also maybe a subpopulation of patients who may benefit from this JAK inhibition without worsening anemia or even uh, with correction or uh, transfusion independency uh, for patients treated with momelotin. So if we cannot switch, we may also think to uh, combine ruxolitinib to try to restore the efficacy after loss of efficacy. As you can see, there are many ongoing studies with many different partners, but the most promising probably are again, two partners that we uh, saw for the first line therapy, Navitoclax, the BCL XL, BCL2 mimetic, uh, that is tested in phase three trial, and Pelabrazib, the BET inhibitor that is also currently tested in the phase three studies. And I, we hope that we will have soon the results of this trial to see if we can restore an efficacy of ruxolitinib uh, without discontinuing completely ruxolitinib. And we may also try to switch 
to a completely another class of drugs because again, there are many, many drugs uh, that are tested, novel agents uh, as uh, investigation. I would just focus on two of them because they have already shown some interesting results. The first one is imetelstat, which is a telomerase inhibitor. You remember that uh, a phase two trial of this uh, drug showed maybe an interesting effect for the patients with the worst prognosis, those that are so-called triple negative or have very poor prognostic mutation. This drug, contrary to all the JAK inhibitors I mentioned before, is given intravenously, is quite difficult uh, to manage, induces some uh, hepatic toxicity, thrombocytopenia, so can be uh, managed only when, as inpatient or outpatient, but uh, is more complicated, let's say, to use. So it will not be a first or maybe second line therapy, but it may occur, it may give us a, a, an alternative treatment for the patients with poor prognosis. And this ongoing phase three impact MF study testing imetelstat versus best available therapy has a very high uh, level primary endpoint, which is for the first time overall survival. So maybe we will have a drug that will clearly show an improvement for overall survival for these patients with very high risk refractory myelofibrosis. The second uh, pathway we can use in this drug is inhibition of MDM2. MDM2 is a negative regulator of P53, and this uh, compound is overexpressed in patients with myelofibrosis. So if you inhibit MDM2, you will restore the activity of P53 and induce, for example, the apoptosis of malignant cells. And this inhibitor, CHIR3232 or naftemadlin, is currently tested in a phase 2-3 study in patients with a refractory or resistant myelofibrosis, randomized versus best available therapy. So now, just to finish a few words on patients with low or intermediate risk uh, disease, how can we treat them? I really think that for these patients, we need to address what is their clinical need, what is their main problem. Is it anemia? Then we have some old solutions like corticosteroids, danazole, EPO and ESA may be efficient for these patients, emit sometimes, and maybe a new option, Ruspatacep. You know that this drug was approved recently for patients with myelodysplastic syndrome and uh, refractory anemia with ring sideroblast. So the spatacept has also shown some efficacy, especially to improve the anemia induced by ruxolitinib and is currently tested in a phase three trial uh, combined to ruxolitinib. And maybe we will have some interesting a way to improve anemia in these patients with this drug in the near future. For patients with symptomatic splenomegaly, hydroxyurea may sometimes uh, uh, induce some responses. I must say that we don't use very rarely since the era of ruxolitinib radiation or splenectomy, but sometimes it still can be useful. If you use radiation, please remember that this should be done at very low dose and fractionated to stop the uh, radiation because as soon as you see a drop uh, in the, the platelets or leukocytes, because it can induce severe pancytopenia that may last for several months. Uh, so please do this radiation very fractionated. If uh, your patient has constitutional symptoms or a symptomatic splenomegaly, Besides being at a low or intermediate one risk, I think ruxolitinib can also be proposed for these patients. So just to conclude, uh, you know very well that what we call myelofibrosis indeed is very heterogeneous. You have patients with normal counts, though some patients with severe cytopenias at baseline, some others with very high counts and stratification of patients using these prognostic systems is useful to help us to develop an individualized management 
for each of these individual patients. Clearly, JAK inhibitors, and we explained it first, but the others coming now, have a significant impact on splenomegaly and symptoms and improve survival in very high-risk patients. Rexolitinib is still, uh, for the moment, the treatment of choice for symptomatic patients, but we still need new therapies, and they are coming for patients with severe psychopenias or those who develop resistance, intolerance, or do not respond adequately to rexolitinib. So thank you very much for your attention, and I would be happy to uh, answer your questions. Thank you very much for your lecture. As I said before, you can now have the possibility to unmute yourself for raising question or a comment the lecture on sharing your experience in your service, whatever you prefer. Also, you can write the questions in the chat. I see a comment in the chat if it was great presentation as always. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you for the excellent lecture also. So I, I echo the same comments. And, and yes, this is really a unique occasion for asking directly to an expert on a such specific clinical domain um, questions. So really do not hesitate to share any comments or any role? I see one question is just arriving. Um, what is the role of PMF0 in PMF development? That's, a, that's an important question. I didn't mention because I, I was asked to talk about primary myelofibrosis, overt myelofibrosis, but as you know, the WHO 2017 uh, define the kind uh, so-called prefibrotic myelofibrosis that indeed mimics essential thrombocytemia. These patients usually have elevated platelets, uh, but at the, you may suspect uh, the, this diagnosis uh, compared instead of ET because these patients are, have often slight splenomegaly, elevated LDH, slight anemia that is not usual in true essential thrombocytemia, and the bone marrow biopsy reveals a grade zero or one myelofibrosis. And as I mentioned, for the diagnosis of PMF, over PMF, you need at least a grade two fibrosis. So you have this subset of patients that have an early stage probably of myelofibrosis, are more prone to evolve to overt myelofibrosis over the years. But I would say for the moment, we don't have a, a therapeutic implication of this diagnosis because we don't have any drug that has been shown to avoid the evolution to overt myelofibrosis. Although there are some candidates, as you know, for me, for example, maybe interferon would be interesting in these patients to uh, diminish the risk of transformation to overt myelofibrosis. So for the moment, once you have this diagnosis, maybe your follow-up will be more careful. Uh, you will see maybe the patient more frequently than true ET patients. Maybe you will do subsequent biopsies after a couple of years to see if the grade of fibrosis has increased in the bone marrow, but it's only, I would say, more for the follow-up of these patients, but no clinical or therapeutic implication today. Thank you very much. Um, so the link question is, would you suggest iron chelation therapy in uh, low risk patients, asymptomatic patients? How so uh, if we finish with the, the follow-up, for example, uh, in low risk and asymptomatic patients, I see them uh, as uh, in consultation usually every six months. Uh, and for those who are more symptomatic, uh, every three months. Thank you. 
Regarding the chelation, iron chelation, it's clear that uh, if you are used to myelodysplasia, for example, we didn't use iron chelation previously, assuming that the survival of the patient was too short, etc. I would say that in myelofibrosis now, we have better survival with jack inhibitors, etc. So even highly transfused patients, in my opinion, deserve iron chelation as long as uh, they have a, an expected survival more than 12 months because you will improve their general condition, you will avoid uh, iron overload, etc. So I would follow almost the same uh, policy than for high risk MDS. Thank you very much. So we we'll go to the next question that I'm seeing. What would you give? to your um, PMF patients with extremely enlarged spleen and serious thrombos thrombocytopenia. Platelet count is between 10, 30. He's old, 70 years old. Well, that, that's typically a very difficult case to treat because uh, any drug you will give will worsen the, the thrombocytopenia. So clearly for this, kind of patients, pacritinib will be very helpful uh, because it doesn't worsen the thrombocytopenia and you can reduce the splenomegaly. Uh, otherwise, if you have nothing else, I would start, if the patient doesn't bleed, that is often the case because they may have these huge spleens, very low platelets, but they don't have hemorrhagic symptoms. I, I usually can start low dose ruxolitinib starting for example by five milligrams twice daily and increase to five and 10 and then 10 twice daily if uh, the patients deserve it well. Another drug that sometimes is active in my experience in this patient is low dose lenalidomide or low dose thalidomide uh, that may also improve uh, thrombocytopenia but it takes time at least two, three months to work. So it could be a, an alternative. Thank you very much. So I go to the next question. Could you comment on your views or routine NGS examination in lower risk MF patients or ones? Uh, that's, a, that's a very important question. Uh, in my opinion, today, uh, these patients are not so frequent, there are not so many, and they all deserve, I think, uh, an NGS evaluation at baseline, uh, because as you mentioned in your question, we have some mutations that confer a poor prognosis, and it may sometimes help to discuss uh, the, the opportunity of transplantation. So clearly I would say yes, all patients with myelofibrosis who are eligible for transplantation, who may benefit from transplantation, should be assessed by NGS. And the other point is men, even sometimes uh, it's useful to do sequential NGS, not every six months, not every year, but sometimes every two years or every three years, because Sometimes you can see clonal evolution in these patients that may also help you to decide. Thank you very much. Uh, for now, I see just a comment. So, well, I think we have really um, envisaged all the aspects of the topic. So thank you very much, Professor Kilajan, for having shared with us your expertise. And also would like to thank all the participants for the debate and the input received this evening. <laughs> Thank you very much to everybody for the question and live discussion. And thank you, Maria Angela, for organizing this nice webinar. <laughs> See you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.